All right, guys, what is going on? It is the Chasing Waypoints podcast, and we are back for another episode. It is Friday afternoon. You guys are going to be listening to this on Sunday. But man, what a week going on. So if you guys haven't heard the last podcast about that vintage 1000, you got to get over and listen to that. It has been absolutely crazy. The inbox has been going off with a bunch of people looking to get into that vintage riding and doing all this kind of stuff. So it's actually really, really cool. Uh, I am surprised at how many people are into that and actually wanting to navigate. So I'm going to be seeing some vintage stuff coming up soon. I'm looking forward uh, to working with the crew, trying to come up with something over here on the West Coast and do some more work. But anyway, this time around, we've got somebody special coming onto the show. That is going to be Chris from over at Moto Minded. You guys are not familiar with them. They are making a bunch of handy products. It started with some 3D printed stuff and now all the way over to Rally Towers. So absolutely looking forward to this conversation. Talking to them. Should be in on the chat here in just a moment. I hope everybody is having a good week. Want to try and catch up with a few of the past guests and see what they are up to in the rally world. Now we've got Sonora Rally coming up here couple months and then we've got Baja Rally the six day event coming up as well I believe they've got another two events also planning for that so should be a lot of fun all right looks like Chris is with us now give us just a sec let's get this music down Chris you there I am can you hear me okay <laughs> yeah we can hear you all right bud how are you good yeah, excellent dude so I was literally about to jump in the car and come home. And of course I'm checking social media and uh, Mason Klein posted a picture of the, uh, the rally kit on his bike. Yeah. You guys have been working on. So that is uh, kind of the topic of conversation, but I kind of want to know a little more about how you guys got started. I remember seeing a bunch of 3d printed stuff kind of starting out that way. Right. Well, the rally moto kit actually started as a company before I started moto minded. Um, yeah, back in 2012, uh, one of my best friends, Ned Cease decided, Hey, I'm going to, well, actually in 2011, he decided I'm going to do Dakar and I happened to be around him and doing road books. And he was really helping us and a lot of our friends just get into and get that rally bug, you know, Mm -hmm. and he put on events, um, out in Utah and some Colorado where he'd write some road books and we'd all run around and get our head around it. And in parallel, I was building, you know, kits for myself and quickly realized, you know, mounting this stuff to the bars is flat out dangerous <laughs> when you start getting a little more advanced, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, with that, um, I came one of the last events before Ned, you know, officially announced, I showed up with a prototype that I was using and riding with that mounted to the frame fully bolt on, this was 2010, I think, right around there, 2010. And by 11, he announced he's going to race it, you know, Dakar in 2012. And we basically refined it and said, and he said, I want to run your kit. Let's build a kit and let's build the bike together. So we did. We built the bike and took about a year riding and testing and getting ready. And all the while he's training and, you know, doing his uh, grassroots effort. Um, and it was pretty cool. We built, uh, you know, one in a spare and, uh, he's the only, in 2012, he was the only American to finish, uh, uh, Dakar on, on a bike. Nice. So that was pretty exciting. So we're like, okay, you know, some demand here. Um, let's see if we sell these. So I, I started a company rally moto kit in 2012 mm-hmm. sold know, probably about 20, 25 kits over a couple of years. Um, I still had a nine to five company. I had another company I owned that was, you know, still like digital 3d based, but so the rally kit was nights and weekends and it, you know, it was kind of like the ultimate little, you know, get you kind of into rally or make a really nice lightweight dual sport bike or, or, you know, use it for, you know, yeah. And it kind of went from there. Um, so a couple of years again, nights and weekends, I was like, this is, you know, it's just a hot, it was a test. We will in the products world. I was in the services world and moving into products. I'm like, this is not good. It's killing all my nights and weekends. Everybody had some event or deadline race, something that they're, you know, shooting towards. So it was, it was just crazy. It wasn't the right time. 
uh, for me. So I shut it down to, and then in the parallel started Moto minded, uh, you know, a couple of years later I started Moto minded mm-hmm. and that was, you're right around a 3d printed product. It was the first, um, uh, product I did was fully 3d printed and brought back the rally Moto kit a few years ago. Um, so like a five year break, I got away from building towers and doing that and got back into it. Um, but in parallel started up moto minded did other products got to know you know we the first product was a pillbox so a 3d printed little holder um that kind of held your your basic essentials um and it's now kind of transformed into the what we now sell today which is our moto essentials kit mek for short mm-hmm. kind of holds that you know that those essential little things on and on your bike or in your gear that uh, you kind of need on a ride of some of these fuel injected European bikes. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of parallels there and other, you know, directions we want the stories, but uh, that, that was kind of the start of, you know, me getting into moto products was the rally moto kit company. And then now it's a product under moto minded, uh, brought it back as a product. Nice. 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 Yeah. Well. And I've, you know, I kind of seen, well, I saw, let's see, it was a Sonora rally a couple of years ago. Uh, I think it was on, was it on, I'm pretty sure it was on Scott Bright's bike. Scott Bright had, had a like prototype. That. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Version two prototype. Mm-hmm. Uh, we developed together just chasing super lightweight, super lightweight. And with others, you might've heard that prototype did not last the race. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I was experimenting with bending some aluminum plates and things like that. And it just didn't work out. So I went back to, you know, went back to the drawing board, you know, that was part of it. You know, you gotta, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And, um, it was a lot of lessons learned in that, uh, one that he had and gone forward in parallel. I've, I've developed a really simple bar mount with him. He like, he kind of went away from the, you know, the fairing. He just wanted less weight, less weight, less weight. And, Together, we developed with his ideas and direction, we developed a really simple uh, bar-mounted uh, one that kind of has three three adjustment bowling points. We may launch it. It's more just a side project for him. And if yeah. someone reaches out, we might do a you know run of five or something like that. But yeah. pretty specific to Scott's wishes. It's a really cool kit. It keeps, you know, back to if you're going to bar-mount that and do the speeds that Scott's doing in a rally, yeah. you need to have it, it you know, that 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 center of mass of all that equipment needs to be like as close to the steering pivot as you can. Otherwise it's going to make some dangerous pendulum effect. You know, if you hit a bump and you got that, that weight kind of levered out six inches, you got some problems. Um, so that, that with Scott, we ended up instead of doing a full tower, you know, I, I kept going the direction I'm doing with the rally moto kit with the full bolt on tower. And then we also built this little minimal bar one that um, Scott's running today um has uh room for basically it puts all the components on the top of the roadbook holder it's about that puts the two icos and the other uh the device and the antennas all up on top uh nothing below the roadbook where a lot of people split it you know with some of the simpler mounting things so again pretty unique to his wishes and i think it works out great mm-hmm. um he's been liking it so yeah, yeah. Uh, but the rally motorcade itself is still yeah that that it's a full, you know, rally kit or dual sport kit, you know, it's sold about 50, 50, I think, you know, it's about roughly 50, 60% of our customers want to, you know, put it on their bike and make a really lightweight dual sport bike where the others are like, I'll start it as like a dual sport setup, but I definitely want to try rally. And it's, it's built that way to convert it back and forth easily. Um, as well as bolt on and off really mm-hmm. fast and easy too. So it's, yeah. and when- it's neat. Yeah when you mean converted is that something that uh from roadbook to gps uh and other accessories or exactly that's the primary thing is the two differences roadbook you know still has the light same lights it still has the same you know ktm you know a lot of these bolt-on rally kits have you know the same ktm rally factory rally replica screen we use the one that the the design that started in 2020 Mm -hmm. uh so the latest one that they're still currently using we're using that screen the the older one was kind of it was dated, you know, it's a look that a lot of others were um, using. I want to get away from that. And this screen performs much better. And we also reuse the air dam component below the screen. That literally does work. It does function to get air down in the radiators. So we're using that um, in conjunction with this clear screen. 
And then the rest of it, yeah, it's kind of really, it's what you, your electronics are really what dictates it from dual sport or rally. You know, mm-hmm. are you doing roadbook and the ICOs or are you doing uh, GPS mount, some other devices, you know, things like that. So, yeah, I'm looking at it on, um, there was actually in somebody, I want to get him on the show because I, I hear he's a total bike nut, but he, you've got his pictures on, on the website uh, with uh, Robbie, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. And and I'm seeing what you're talking about the air dam. So you know, people listening in and not not seeing this, and I'll I'll post some links uh, in the bottom. But so you've got the windscreen, and then just below it, you've got kind of these fins that that spread out. So those are functional and getting air down into the radiators. Is that what they kind of aim it a little bit downward? And then with our little side panel connectors, if you choose to run those, uh, they come with the kit. Um, they basically connect you know, they're the lower part connecting to the bike. They're not structural. They're just more aesthetic. They also help a lot more capturing some of that wind and keep it from going up over the tank and downward into the radiators. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and you guys, so you did both testing. I mean, obviously with that, you're getting air into the radiators, but you did mention something a minute ago about the windscreen. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm personally, I'm not a fan of the newer style, but I have a feeling that you've got some info that might change my mind. What, what did you guys notice in going from the older to the newer, uh, less buffeting and really just less limiting. So where we position the screen with the generation before the limit in the steering was hand guards hitting the screen. So unless you trimmed them, mm-hmm. you limited your turning radius in a rally situation. No big deal. You know, you're not making tight switchback turns, you know, things like that. When in a rally situation, maybe in your practice, you might. But I really wanted to get the, I wanted to, you know, keep, you know, as much as the steering, uh, you know, as lock to lock is the best we can. And, and, and the goal for that is more, you know, the guys doing the dual sporting and my, you know, my testing and riding, you know, I ride, when I set this up, I'm riding single track. I'm doing everything with this bike. I'm trying to beat it up. I've hit whoops and everything myself, Mason Klein as well. One of our sponsored riders mm-hmm. and we're just putting them through the paces. And one of the things I really wanted was, you know, more and more steering range. And I'm, we're only losing about five to eight degrees, depending on your setup that you're running hand guards or tower. So the mechanics of the tower itself now, um, really doesn't limit the steering hardly at all anymore for this last version that we had this version three. Um, it's a, it's a, it's also a lighter screen, um, because it, and it's a more, I think the vertical, the almost straight vertical shape of it, um, tends to or the compared to the previous version, which was much more sloped. It had a lower chin protruding out and then it sloped back and then it had a little lip at the top where, I mean, at the time that was, that was one of the best performing screens at the time, but they just, the improvements they made on it, I, I, don't, I don't know if they win tunnel tests or what, but <laughs> it just works better. Um, uh, less buffeting, less, and, and and then blocking all that, you know, that wind, so less fatigue, you know, where a lot of the screens, you know, that's the primary purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I noticed, I mean, I have the, the older generation uh, style on my 790, mm-hmm. and... And I do notice that 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 buffeting and I always kind of wonder, I go, well, there's, you know, there's a reason they probably went to this. And that's it sounds like it's, you know, they were specifically targeting that and it didn't gain. It doesn't look like it's any taller than the previous stuff. No, it's not. Okay. Yeah, it's it's really, really close to the same height. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, So it's just and I I get it to where I position. I kind of have. um and if you jump on there, that that Robbie one that we have on the website you're talking about, it's kind of the we used it. It's great looking bike. So we, <laughs> we asked, "Can we use that in our marketing?" He goes, "Absolutely!" I'm like, "Thank you." Is uh, yeah, that thing's just great looking. Um, and his has a tower on it. You can see his is his has got a really what I call you know the pr- pr- a very traditional setting. You know, if you're up on the pegs and you're glancing down at the roadway, that is a kind of the position you want. And it also makes a very I would say safe and smooth cockpit. You know, if you're face the way you look and face at it, you know, from devices on the bars, your roadbook holder, the ICOs, and then the top of the tower is all in one plane. So you don't really have anything protruding out more than the other component. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and this does look, um, like I said, I mean, the, the profile and the angle of it, and at least from my experience, what I've seen is important. I've had, um, uh, 
at Baja Rally, what was it, two years ago now? Mm -hmm. Down in San Felipe, we had a couple riders, uh, one notably uh, Ray Dasoglio. He he hit uh, a couple of times, hit his road book uh, with his chin, uh, with the chin bar of the helmet. Yep. Um, so they were struggling to, to keep the glass pieces together on it. Um, but it was because it was a handlebar mounted kit. So it's up a lot closer. Yeah. So, yep. so I could see that. Yeah. The safety aspect of, you know, keeping this a little bit further away and then on a, on the same plane. Yeah. Yep. Nice. And it's, you know, it's truly, and some guys use it when it's in the dual sport mode, you know, it's kind of, you know, a lot of the riders are sitting down and glancing at the GPS where, you know, the ro road book mode is your, as you know, you know it's kind of different, you know, it's a different animal where, you know, you're either racing or you're navigating, you know, you're, yeah. you're sitting down, getting memorizing, okay, memorize some tulips, maybe glancing down, you know, the better, more advanced guys are able to glance down, memorize some tulips and mileage mm -hmm. and hammer on yeah. and not look at that again for, <laughs> you know, five, six K, you know, yeah. and, and do it like me, like 2.58, 2.58, right? Turn 2.58. It's just <laughs> repeating that in your head as you're going, you know? <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to not ride off into yeah. the sunset <laughs> yeah <laughs> right right and not blow the turn which yeah. is i'm pretty I'm, i i wouldn't say i'm famous for it but i'm not you know that's the one thing i need to work on is just you know it's just practice as you know on the, on this stuff is um you know i still really love the grassroots aspect of it and that's what uh, this rally motor kit's about a lot this is not uh, this is not a profit giant profit making product for us you know um it's it's, it's, you know, version one was definitely like, it was half hobby, just helping people get into the sport. And now we're at the point is like, okay, we've made some advances in our manufacturing and learned some lessons. And yeah, this is, uh, you know, what we feel is one of the best products out there as far as a bolt on rally kit, but, and make it affordable as I can. I was trying to make it lightweight, affordable and functional as I can and try to hit as many of those check boxes as we can. But behind that, this is still a passing project. I still, you know, its primary function still to me is to get people into rally. Mm -hmm. You know, you can afford it as affordably as we can. Yeah, there's a, there's a bar mounted stuff. If you're trying out, you know, you could jump on RMS website and find a ton of those, you know, just, you know, all inclusive. He, he does a good job of those bar mounted, you know, the two beans coming out, robot mm -hmm. holder, Goblicos, you're rolling. You know, that's a great beginner kit. But as you advance and you get, some faster speeds, you should really be getting that weight off your bar. Mm -hmm. um, if you find out, you know, this is something you want to invest more time and money in and, and, you know, look at bolt on kits like ours. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think I, I get a kick out. Like Mason was really one of our first Mason Klein who's, a whole, you know, on his way to the car 2022. And, and he's, we've been sponsoring him since he first got into rally. His dad, Larry Klein approached us at one of the KTM adventure rallies a few years back. And, at the time, Mason, you know, he's, he's about two foot shorter than he is now. And, <laughs> and his dad's like, he's killing it at the dead. You know, he's SoCal desert racer kid. And he is just, he was at pro level you know, when he was, I think when he was like 16 and, and dad's like, I got to slow him down. I want to look at rally. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it, I, it may have slowed him down for a day because Mason's wicked smart and picked up the navigation so fast. Yeah. And, now he's, you know, at Sonora a couple of years ago, he had some, you know, some, I wasn't there that year, but I heard, he, you know, a couple of years ago, he had a couple of issues, um, whether it be mechanically or electrically or whatever it was. But I mean, and it is still allowed him to keep riding, you know, even though he didn't complete one of the days, but um, he was keeping up there. He was top, you know, he was top three, four on those remaining days and just proven that he could ride and navigate. Yeah. And it's been exciting. You know, that's part of, like I said, back to that grassroots, I'm really excited. And we knew all the way he's going to graduate to a real rally back someday, you know, but until then he had, he had the, all the tools he needed with our rally motor kit. So that was exciting. It was one of our best success stories we have. Yeah. Well, and he's, I mean, I know him and him and Skyler have been, been trading road books and, and working together and, and doing a lot. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he's, uh, the, the speed is there and the, the, the drive, to do it and obviously he's got that natural talent i don't know what it is about you know him both him and skyler because you can tell they can navigate and it's yeah. they make it seem effortless yeah so it really yeah it, it seems right and there's challenges you know you you're out there at those practices and stuff like that everybody gets challenges you know that's the ideas you know work on that stuff that you're you need to work on and and but yeah they're just i mean you know get the 
they have the base riding ability done. You know, they're fast as a racer. Check. Done. Let's move on. Let's work on navigation. <laughs> yeah, <you know>? yeah. <laughs> Where, you know, you and I might be working on all of it. Yeah. <laughs> Still working on, you know, riding fast, safe, and, and then adding the navigation to it. But it's it's truly a passion of mine. I absolutely love it. And and love, you know, this part of the grassroots doing it. And actually, this will be the first place we announce. We're going to formally announce it next week. But, or you know, this I think this is going to air Sunday. A couple days. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, perfect then. Um, we're going to announce that you know, I'm going to donate $100 uh, every rally kit sale, rally motor kit sale to Mason's effort for 2022 and just continue to, you know, hopefully help him nice. get to Dakar. Yeah. yeah. That is awesome. Neat. Yeah. I mean, that's, and, and it's cool. You know, it, I mean, I've, I've known, I, I did not know about the ro- rally moto kit uh, before, you know, I just thought it started as, as moto minded. So, you know, the, the, that support of the grassroots and really like, you know, pushing and, and helping and doing this. So that's awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm sure Mason's going to appreciate it. He probably already knows, but I think it'll be, <laughs> uh, <laughs> or if not, it'll be a surprise, but that, that's totally awesome. I mean, I know he, he I just recently saw, I think he was doing t-shirts and stuff like that. And so, yep. Yeah, the T-shirts he did for a while. Then I just pitched this the other day and just said, "Hey, how about you know, I chip in a portion of the sales to help your effort. You know, at least it'd be a win-win. You know, people would see that. You know, get some good PR, and, and it's going to help him. You know, again, we don't we don't sell a ton of these, so it's going to help. Like he's getting us a big fat check at the end, but every bit helps, as you know. You know, when oh, you yeah. do these grassroots efforts, um, and it really helps. I mean, he's got there's a lot of expenses, as you can imagine. I mean, just being around Ned's effort. I was there at the start. This was when 2012 line um, started in, and finished in, uh, well, it started in Argentina. Mm-hmm. And um, all the ceremonies and everything were in Buenos Aires. So I was there for the start. We were patiently waiting the bike to arrive via the shipping container. <laughs> Flew down, waiting on the bike, and it came, like, last minute. Like, so last minute. And on that shipping container was, you know, uh, I think uh, Jonah Street's bike was on at the time. Bill Conger's bike was in the ship. So everybody's waiting on their bikes, you know, and and Rally Pan Am's truck was in. I mean, it was just nuts that um, everybody was waiting on this shipping container to the last minute. And I helped everybody prep, so I handed it off to, you know, the one mechanic was helping out Bill and Jonah and Ned, and I'm handing off the bike to Ned or, you know, to the, uh, the mechanic at the time and mm-hmm. going through it, and that my role was done. They went off. I, I actually, we had a rental car and I dropped them off the first morning to go race. And I saw none of it. <laughs> I saw none of the race. <laughs> hung out another couple of days and flew back. Yeah. But it was neat. It was just so neat. It was basically a year of my life. And and my wife says that today she was a rally widow for that year. Just helping, you know, we were just all helping Ned get to that, get to that start. It was a pretty exciting year. Yeah, it's uh... But it got to learn the cost. Back Circling back to that, like the, the amount of time and cost is just, unbelievable you know to do that event even at the private tier level it's just amazing yeah it, it everything that i've you know in the research and, and just digging and talking to different people and all that stuff it's like okay uh dakar 2022 uh this is the conversation in you know fourth quarter of 2019 because it takes or or 2020 you know you take the whole year and then some to just be able to prep for it. I mean, it's whether it's yeah. financially, whether it's the bike, whether it's physically, whether whatever, it takes literally a whole year to do this. You know, Baja 1000, couple months, whatever. <laughs> but, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's kind of like you're stringing six of these together, you know, and going to race for the better part of a month, you know. So it's, uh, it, it definitely, uh, I, I've learned a lot in, in over the different episodes and stuff. So it's, about this so what um so tell me a little bit about your like uh have you done any kind of rallies like what what have you participated in what have you done you know roadbook wise and that kind of stuff on your end yeah i've done a lot of the you know the rally pan am practices any other you know a lot of the sport as you know is pretty underground you mm-hmm. know uh, especially in the, in the u.s um so writing and sharing roadbooks and doing that practicing you know it's kind of you gotta get into that club you know and really just doing the rally pan am uh, events, you know, when they do the practice, things like that, that's really the best way to get, I recommend everybody start that way to kind of get your feet wet and, and just keep digging and keep networking and hearing about those events. Um, so a lot of practices, uh, I was writing a lot with Ned, you know, in 2012 and really 
doing that. So he's off and doing the car. And then a few months later, um, Nora started, you know, they'd been doing the Mexican 1000 as a vintage only race. Well, in 2012, they allowed modern bikes and Scott Whitney helped who you may or may not know, you know, authors, a lot of, you know, he's got, he's like the grandfather writing road books and, and stuff in North America. And they hired him to write some road books for, um, for the Mexican 1000 that year. So I was like, Oh, and they did a road book only class, no GPS. So I'm like, I'm in, I've been writing and practicing with it, you know, <laughs> got my head around it. I was like, I think I'm ready. So that, that was my first, like, you know, and it's still, you know, at the time it, it was still like a fun race, you know, kind of each night was like, it, there's people partying it up each night, you know, and just half vacation, half race, but it ended up being a race. Like a lot of us, um, kind of got at the end, you know, these classes and stuff like that, where there, you know, there's some modern bikes in there, everything from super enduros to, uh, bikes like mine. Uh, so, uh, I think, what was I on? It was a 500 at the time, uh, mm -hmm. X, XCW. And, uh, yeah, it was, that was kind of the, you know, kind of proved to myself I can do it. You know, those big miles navigation wasn't that challenging. Like the, the stuff we were practicing, whether it be Scott Whitney's road books and the ones in Ned road or other mm -hmm. ones that we're, you know, practicing on, you know, that year prior, far more complicated and more challenging and more of that Dakar level, you know, that Scott Whitney historically wrote road books for. And, um, so the navigation was that challenging, but it was a lot of miles. So that was kind of mentally like, you know, there's, you get the points where you're just blasted as fast as I bike can go for hours and just going like, I'm kind of over this. And I could see, like, I hear the stories, like, especially the last couple of years of Saudi Arabia, like there's road books that, uh, um, you know, Andrew short described, like they got it. Like it, you rolled up road book paper was, you know, maybe a diameter of a quarter for the whole day. And it was like, I forget how many, it was like 500 K <laughs> like, you're not making many turns. <laughs> it's something like that. If you have that many, it just burnt. I just thought I just couldn't imagine that day yeah. just being on the bike that long at, at, at race pace, just Literally or, a or, travel day. <laughs> or liaison or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Those many miles just in a day. I was like, man, he almost did one day. What, you know, it was half of my race, you know, Oh, man. Yeah. And I've done, um, I did the first Baja rally. Um, and I think what was that? 2014 or 15. Uh, it's all kind of blurring. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <All> these, <laughs> and then, and then I've done the, I was lucky enough to last year do the Wyoming rally, which is, you know, one of those little bit underground ones, uh, more practice kind of thing, you know, um, not a race, but you know, times are, tracked <laughs> and uh, but really neat terrain really really neat if you have the chance go if you get invited yeah that's one i recommend it's one of the coolest ones in north america yeah. i it's 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 kind of cool i like this underground thing you know and and, yeah. and yeah because you know so you're just riding with a group of guys and you're and just checking it out and i and i was gonna say is that no matter where what how if you get a bunch of guys together on a motorcycle you put a road book in front of them or you say you're even keeping time or even if you're not, it's likely going to turn into a pissing contest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just doesn't. There's two guys. It's good fun. <laughs> there's two, yeah. Two guys, two bikes. Yeah. It's going to be a race. It's going to be a race. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you like it, you know, the pace is going to start picking up little by little, little right. by little. Yeah. Next thing you know, you're backing bikes into corners. and. <laughs> yeah. You know, going and there's a whole thing. grassroots of support. You know, there's not just the, you know, the, what the rally pan I'm doing. There's a few of us that are trying to write road books for, you know, some of our top competitors to practice. And it would, you know, other than I was you know, mentioning it here, we're keeping it pretty tight. You know, I think in the future, maybe next year, they might be used for the rally pan M courses, but we're working on some uh, stuff that, you know, the challenging things for like Ray Beck and short and those guys and Skyler and now, you know, Mason is just getting enough miles, um, mm. to practice and hit those things are challenging. Like there's some OAA challenges that they've been throwing. You heard about the navigation issues. If you let out, you're probably going to lose a half hour, right? Mm -hmm. On the Dakar last year. Yeah. So they're really taken down. They get, they taken away that map map and map man. Mm -hmm. And you discussed it on your podcast. You know, people have discussed that a few times. It's, I don't need to reiterate, it, but there's some new challenges. You know, you really got to navigate now. You just can't follow and, and rely on your map map anymore. And I, I really love that. I think I love that it evens the field and 
you just saw that like it was anybody's race for three quarters of the car last year or I, this year i yeah. completely yeah. i blame that change or i blame that situation on specifically on that change you know that the tires yeah. was one thing but you know everybody pretty that was much ridiculous yeah and and the tire roll is ridiculous it's just yeah. their sad attempt there i'm sure there's like in you know, they've always had, you know, since they moved from Africa, they've had, the, you know, what's the driving issue? Insurance, getting insurance to race this thing. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure there's some pressure to, you know, and obviously you want to keep the speeds down. You don't want yeah. people getting hurt. You know, these bikes are getting, as discussed earlier in your podcast, lighter and faster every yeah. year. And, and what can they do? That tire thing was kind of a, they're not, they're pros. You know, they're yeah. going to, they're going to give it 10,000%, mm-hmm. whether that rule works or not for them, they're yeah. still going to burn the tires. Yeah. Hey, what's the, right, what's, what's the red line on the spike? Yeah, it's a 10 K. Yeah. Okay. I'll keep it at nine, 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 nine. Back it off for a second. Okay. Now yeah. we're back on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I think that, yeah, l- just let it breathe every 30 to 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. but, you know, you're right. And it was, and it was in talking to Skylar about it, you know, I thought like, okay, it kind of, this tire rule kind of makes sense to me. I see what they're trying to do. You have to be strategic about when you're going to go full send on these things because you will burn through, a 450 will burn through a set of tires very quickly. And it, you, it plays into that. But then after talking to him, I'm going, you know, that's very true. The pace doesn't slow down. It's who's willing to risk more on a tire that's not gripping. And, and yeah, ultimately, you just hit it. That, what did they do? They made it more dangerous for the racers. They did. Because yeah. they're still going to do it 100% on right. that crappy tire that's barely is going to be in the court soon. Yeah. They're going to run it till it falls apart. Yeah. Well, you saw it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and I think that it's got to be... Um, they got to come at it from a different way. Okay. Like, okay. The end goal is to slow, slow everybody down. All right. So how are we going to do that? Like, you know, are we going to, uh, you know, I don't know, limit the top speed on the bike, uh, somehow, or, you know, make something spec, you know, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, formula one's been trying to do it forever. They made the cars narrower and they just went faster. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you know, it, there's, yeah, that. there's gotta be yeah, something that's... safer than that to do. Yeah. And I don't have, I don't have, we don't have the answer. No. Hopefully they'll do it or it doesn't like ruin the sport or make it less interesting. But, yeah. you know, the tire thing was like, okay, you know, you're already limiting it to 450 mm-hmm. and you're finding out, okay, technology wins, right? So yeah. they're going to make them lighter and faster. Find a way. It works. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, yeah. It'll... I love rally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, do too. I mean, it's, it's, you know, the, the thing is the challenge and that was like, like they roped it by doing what they did. They roped it all the way back into almost a grassroots level. And then I know that they're going to be going to uh, digital road books and everything is going to be, uh, you know, basically like, OK, I'm going to flip the switch. OK, here's your road book. It's already colored for you. You know, good luck. We'll see you in 7000 kilometers, you know, and. I see what they're doing and they're working towards that. And I think that it's going to make a big difference in the sport and even out the playing field like it did this year, you know, but Mm -hmm. now it's going to turn into, well, what's the next thing that they're going to look because there's no way that Honda, well, there's no way KTM is just going to say like, eh, it was too, you know, we missed the podium twice. No big deal. No, they're in there doing their homework, you know, trying to figure out how they're going to get that advantage again. Yeah. So, I, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm stoked to see that, but more stoked that, you know, that there is more stuff going on here in the States uh, for that rally, you know, and, and practicing that stuff. If you guys are doing road books or if I hear, you know, there's road book stuff coming and going and back and forth, the rumblings are getting bigger and bigger little by little. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I'm all for it. But what, um, so I mean, for you, like, what was your very first like road book? And was there anything like when you were getting started that you know now that you wish you knew then? I don't think, no, it hasn't changed much. From that. Like my very first road book, I remember Ned wrote it and it it was handwritten and we made Xerox copies in the middle of desert and <laughs> or attempted to make Xerox <laughs> copies in the middle of desert in Utah. And mm. they're handwritten and then Xerox, you know, pre-run, you know, you, Drafted them, wrote them, made some changes, made copies right there in the desert. And that, from that to what I ride today, I, I nothing really, no regrets. I know nothing that really I need to do. It just keeps, keep, 
you know, it's just keep refining, you know, I mean, I, have you written some roadbook stuff or is it mainly desert? I know you have the history of desert racing and yeah, most, being around that a lot, but how about road books? I haven't, uh, I haven't sat behind a road book long enough. Uh, I've okay. only done you know, really basic stuff. So the one thing that kind of sets some people apart pretty quickly, once you start getting your head around, it's not just in, you got to get your head around whoever authors that road book. Mm-hmm. So in the case of Dakar, you know, it's, they keep it a pretty good standard. You know, you're not trying to get into, for example, Scott Whitney's head or Scott Bright's head or Ned's or whoever's you're writing, uh, Jimmy Lewis, you know, he's doing a great job helping out our, our U S guys, you know, really do the training and stuff like that. And, and part of that is, you know, you're, you're trying to get in their head of like, oh, okay, is he tricking? Is this trick coming up here? Is this, you know, if you're dead on accurate and you're falling accurate that you don't have to, you know, kind of sometimes flows a lot, but one thing that, people seem to catch on faster and it seemed like maybe Matt Mason and Skyler and those guys really got in their head faster than I, I still working on it is, you know, that next tulip says, you know, in another 15 K 15.2 K you're going to have, you know, there's a T intersection or it turns into single track and you got to find this faint single track going off to the right. Mm-hmm. Where in that horizon, as I look beyond that road book and look ahead and the trail (laughs) and AKA dirt road or whatever it is in front of me, where's that three point, whatever K yeah, in my horizon. And how do I get used to, you know, usually I really get it in my head. It's back in practice by the end of that road book. (laughs) I was like, I got this. Oh, there's two K out there. You know, I kind of just, you know, pick that spot on the horizon or wherever it may be, whether you're in the dunes or whatever, it's like, okay, two K is about there. And I'm able to eyeball that quickly and not blow past it and start slowing down and look for it before it's, you know, one K behind you or half a K behind you and getting that in your head, I think is one of the things that really being able to practice that and, and hit those marks a little better really seems to, you know, your, your performance goes up and you get to that point of those, you know, aliens, as we call them, those really fast guys that are top <laughs> ones that really just, it all comes together to them, you know, and they practice them enough where us amateurs here are mere, mere mortals or, you know, constantly not just trying to interpret what that is. And that is that turn, you know, that's tilted 45 degrees. Is that road really spilling out 45 or is the next one that's a half, you know, 0.1 K up here. Mm -hmm. Is it that one? Yeah. Yeah. Is it that one? And that's some of the tricks that, you know, Whitney did it. uh, You know, they all do it. You know, you want to practice it as, you know, being dead on, on your, on your mileage is, um, you know, it might say here's a left turn, you know, at, and it might be a 90 degree, you know, turn intersection. Uh, and you're going to turn right here and maybe 0.1 K is another one, you know, and the one that you chose is not the right one. And it meanders off, you know, and you've gone three K to figure out your error and turn around where the one just, you know, 0.1 K back was the, actually the one you wanted it headed to the Southwest and this one headed to the Northwest. Yeah. And really just, I love that part of it, you know, where, you and I might not be the fastest guy out there on the bike, but we, if you can navigate well, you mm-hmm. kind of it levels the playing field a little bit. Yeah. Um, and that's where I geek out, and it keeps bringing me back. <laughs> Keep practicing and, and getting into it. I love, I love riding you know, the road books. And now I'm really getting into the creation and, and really watching the digital side of it. Where mm-hmm. I, um, Here soon we're going to be working on a mount for the digital. Basically, they're going to be tablets for us for a while, you know, yeah. until there's some standardization that we're, mm-hmm. you know, us will maybe someday be able to buy, but for a long time, it's going to be like, what are you running? You're on an iPad or an Android or this device or that device. So, um, the one I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to watch everything out there and try to pick the most universal and then adapt, you know, the, probably the top two most universal or ubiquitous or who's using what, you know, and kind of make a mount, make our tower adapt to that. Um, so I'm thinking I'm going to go, I'm kind of an Android guy and there's a, uh, rally navigator makes a great app for it. I've been practicing that. So Samsung makes a very affordable, very robust tablet, mm-hmm. um, that I'm going to make a mount adapt to it. It's an active two. I think it is galaxy active two. Yeah. And I've seen it a lot. I've seen it in Europe a lot, people using it. So mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, this thing has some legs, yeah. a little Bluetooth were wired or, you know, we're working on actually Mason's helping me a little bit with, you know, do we do Bluetooth or wired or something like that? Mm-hmm. Um, or work with rally blitz guys to see if we could adapt their hardware, you know, and which is 
kind of like that's kind of where it's at in our world. You know, is what devices are we putting on these towers or uh, robux? You know, right now it's paper. It's going to be paper for a long time, uh, mm-hmm. but we really got to follow the um, the digital stuff and keep on it. So when that and it is sim- in one way it's simpler. I still have a really tough time tough time getting my head around. There's not much. It's hard to make it redundant. Where you know, with the paper road books, you had extra mask, you know, you had extra tape. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if it tears, if you wipe out, something happens, you know, you could bend it, form it back. It's very analog, right? And yeah. you can repair it out in the middle of nowhere um, with some tape or some more Sharpies or whatever it may be. You <laughs> can rock, fix that really. duct tape, yeah. whatever. <laughs> Bluetooth fails, <laughs> yeah. tablet, you smash your face into your, your helmet, you chin your helmet into the tablet. You, unless you have one in your backpack, you know, as a backup, you're kind of done. Your yeah. ride's done. And I have an issue with that. And especially is there's going to be some challenges. I think we'll get around them. But for a while, there's this, there's going to be this big limbo period yeah. to we adapt something. And this grassroots part, you know, thus practicing us grassroots guys that want to help, you know, the the fast guys. What do we adapt to, you know, and kind of follow that. Yeah, I'm not the leader of this. I'm just going to follow it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll just make sure whoever, whatever the, whatever is a popular direction. Okay, we'll make sure it adapts to our kit. Yeah, yeah and I, I, I think you're right. I've seen, uh, I've seen a couple of people running the Android setup, and with what Rally Navigator did, I think they've they've created a really unique product, even even for building roadbooks too. You know, being able to basically yeah. build a roadbook as you ride. Uh, right then and there, you know, being able to do notes and stuff like that, I think is is absolutely huge. Um, but yeah, I I agree with you. I think it's going to be Android, and it's going to be it it's going to be really interesting to see these guys in Dakar. You know how that progresses. I know uh, was it, it's called the I think it's called the Tower One. I think it was the I think one. you're right. Yeah, I yeah. saw uh, I saw a video of uh, KTM. And it was, I think they were doing like something with Toby and and the guys and they were like at one of the factories. And I don't know that they realized or whatever, but in the background, you could see them already had the tower and they had a tablet on it that looked like the tower one. So -hmm. they're already designing this. So they, we know for sure that this is, is coming, you know, but how big, like, is it going to be a 2022 thing or is it going to be, you know, 2023 or what they're. Right, because they're definitely using and testing one of the cars in the truck. So yeah. I don't even know if they were in the buggies or quads, but definitely not on bikes. Bikes are right. They were pre-marked paper last yeah. year, and you know the pre-marking obviously was, I think, was good. In some ways, it was good. You can see some just I forget who it was. There's a bunch of video. You know, seeing people just taking a red highlighter and just highlighting dangers. You know, putting their own touch on it while they're loading. You know, mm-hmm. you, know you, got, you got minutes to get this thing in. Yeah. There's no studying of it. There's no map map scene. You know, there's no reverse engineering <laughs> of it, nope. which is great one way. But the other is, you know, you need to trust, really trust the people where, you know, that's one of the things you just learned all these years of marking the road book is you put your flavor on it. Mm-hmm. What, you know, to me, I always put, you know, an indicator if there's a turn coming up to the left, if there's going to be an intersection to the left or turn to the left. You know, I mark that left side of that paper a little bit more in my way. And you see these other tricks that other people do and you adapt some and you make up your own and mm-hmm. not be able to do that was kind of like, whoa. And now digital, there's no way to, you know, no. you can't put any of your marks on it. You can't put that red highlighter at the last second. That's going to be interesting. Like you said, it's, it's, and it, yeah, it does level the playing field in that way. But in the other is like, there's, does it, you know, is it really safer? I guess, yeah. you know, the guys are going to adapt. They will adapt. Does it make it more fair? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 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 I think they'll, you know, they're going to, they're going to have to work on a standard. And so they're all operating on the same wavelength as far as like, okay, you know, we're going to put, you know, triple dangers or whatever. We're just going to mark the whole box red, you know, or yeah. something, you know, I'm, I'm sure that that, that'll be liquid or fluid um, and, and moving back around. So, but you know, I think you kind of mentioned earlier too, is paper's not going to go away. It's going to be a long time before paper goes away. You know, definitely for us on the grassroots. Yeah. 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 And yeah. It's just, it's, there's a system to it. Yeah. It's very analog. It's time consuming, mm-hmm. but it's very affordable. Right. Let's go back to that thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I want to get into rally just for fun. Mm-hmm. The cost of that, not just, not just the equipment costs, but the travel, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, all these guys that come to like the rally Pan Am free events, Mm-hmm. They're coming from all over the country. There's guys coming from East Coast and all this, you know, and they 
just the cost of taking that much time off mm-hmm. and let alone all the stuff you bolted on your bike and the time that you're doing it. And then I'm seeing the cost too, where I'm trying to write these road books for others and wow, you know, I've had a few trips just to do this, just to practice, you know, we write them on the side, you know, you sketch them basically on the satellite first. Mm-hmm. And then you kind of run these tracks or you get tracks from someone and kind of make your own tracks and then bring that in the rally navigator. How, you know, there's a couple of ways to kind of start from idea to the first draft of your rally pro book. Mm-hmm. Just the time in that is yeah. just, I mean, you could spit one out, you know, you could go, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which, that's kind of the first one I did way back was like, you know, just here's some, here's a route I like, and I want to share that with my friends. So I'm gonna make a road book with it. Mm-hmm. And so I knew it well, I had it memorized, you know, basically I knew every little, you know, every foot of that route and did it. But, um, the time in that was still a lot in it, you know, and then you go to share it and hopefully everybody else enjoys it and rides it. And, and, you know, do they have the time to do it? You know, it's just kind of, it's an expensive sport for sure. And, and that's why I like kind of the, you know, what we're doing is kind of helping those people mm-hmm. get in, you know, to the start of it. It's kind of help yeah. every little bit helps. Right. Because it's, like I said, it's expensive. Yeah. And, and like anything else, like it's the, the investment of the equipment, like you're saying, I mean, you, you're still going to pay for the equipment. You're still going to pay to build a bike. Um, and then you're going to pay to travel. But I think the, it, you have to be passionate about it, but then at the same time, you got to think like, okay, I am signing up for this adventure. I may never line up at the Dakar, but I'm developing a skill set that if I won the lottery next year, you know, and I just had stupid money to throw away. I could rent a bike, fly out there, and I have the skill set to at least be able to navigate. May mm-hmm. not meet all the requirements. They may not even let you line up, but it's good to dream. All right. But, I, you know, I see that in, and in talking to you, too, about just the travel aspect of it and, and seeing different places. Where, where, I mean, I don't know if you can divulge, but, like, where are you guys doing road books? Where have you gone to do road books here in the States? It's a lot, you know, the easiest place to ride them and get away, you know, because you, you want to be out there, you know, even I don't even like seeing people that are in the same practice event. It drives me insane if I see someone else <laughs> in really? front of me or I know someone's behind me. Because okay. then you get to that, that little game, is he going the right way? Am I going the wrong way? <laughs> and he goes, you know, like, is that, oh, did I do something? Did I miss a turn? And, yeah. you know, you see some dust cloud out in the distance. So like, he's way over there. Did I, what did I do? And just not seeing and just concentrating on my own ride is mm-hmm. really what I try to focus on. So in doing that and to be able to get that really remote and do those big miles and not be in a popular weekend location, you're in the desert. Mm-hmm. You're in the desert. And, you know, it's California desert, Utah, Arizona, Nevada, kind of that area right there are the popular ones. There are some road books that uh, Rally Pan M used last year that are in uh, Colorado area um goes into utah a little bit but um um desert again <laughs> it was far west far west uh, uh colorado and um there's one um and, you know it just that seems to be the best area you know mm-hmm. just ease of use tracks and then you just you know to be able to get out there and isolate um not not be around you know not be riding through a popular riding area where you might get you know meet up with someone or, you know, a line of Jeeps or something like that. Cause as we know, just in this COVID time, we were seeing it at the last rally Pan Am. I was like, Oh man, we have to go through that area. It might be a little crowded. And there was literally a traffic jam in the dirt because so many people are out camping. You know, it was like, like it was a bit ridiculous. So getting out and away seems to be the easiest way is the desert. Yeah. Yeah, and, just, and it turns out, you know, as we saw, like, where Brayback and Short and Skyler, all of them are practicing, is a very similar terrain to what they're racing in the car. You know, you know, if you bring it to that level, you know, just, you know, um, that, you know, that's, you know, kind of the, you know, the high bar of the sport is the car, and it's in that desert area now, and and we have plenty of, you know, wide open desert here to practice and ride and stuff like that. So, and even the, you know, the, uh, the Yellowstone Rally, Wyoming Rally, is, you know, I was calling it earlier. Was, technically but Yellowstone in that area is, you know, nothingness desert. Like I didn't see a tree for a long time. <laughs> it's pretty, <laughs> pretty remote out there. Um, and I was surprised it was neat terrain. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, you know, if you're, if you go do some road books with Jimmy Lewis, you know, and get in some of his programs and training and things like that, you know, he's, 
he's out there in the desert in the middle of the desert too. So, you know, that's kind of, that's it. Desert. Short yeah. answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just find a desert and go make circles in it. Find a desert, make some yeah. tracks. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And it, it really is that basic because the idea, I mean, like I, I'm really good, I think with the concept of it and I've seen it, like I've seen uh, when I was with Baja Rally in the time there that the road book side of it and building road books and delving into it. And, and I, I did none of it. And it was all really, it was all Scotty. I mean, he, it was one of those things like he would go ride and get lost on his XR 650. And, you know, all we had was the bleep on the radar from his spot tracker. And, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden we'd get this random communication from him about this bitch and wash or this thing that he found. And, and then comes back and then locks himself basically in his office for 48 hours. Nobody knows of him. And the next thing you know, there's a full road book ready. Yeah. And, and it's like it takes the writing of it, but then it takes the time to lie, lay it out and, and draw it up and do all of these things to get it to a pro level. But, it, you know, like what you were talking about earlier, if you guys were just Xeroxing them in the desert, you know, it doesn't getting started. It doesn't matter. You don't need that like super fancy road book. You just right. need some arrows and some distances. And that's, I think that's back to the technology. I think that's some of the attractiveness of the digital. It's easier to get to to that idea to your first track to try mm-hmm. your first road book to do if it's digital to me, mm-hmm. the way, the way it is now with rally light navigator is really my favorite right now. And it seems to be, there's a bit of a movement in the grassroots that people are navigating. You know, there's some, they've done some really nice upgrades lately. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I know the team. I've known the team behind it for so long. And those guys are just wicked smart, not just with writing, you know, creating the tools to do it, but they've been in the rally world for a very long time and know what they're doing. And it's just exciting to see that. Yeah, you could throw and there's I've seen them, too, where there's some road books that are just thrown in. You know, it's like, ah, follow that desert, go around here. Where I've noticed the time is and where I've been taught and and written the road books other people is like i want to take you to an interesting feature an interesting thing to ride like mm-hmm. this get you through this epic watch wash mm-hmm. you know five and that's some of the exciting things of some of these you know practice road books is like you look ahead and you see wash and the next exit is like four miles i'm like four miles of a wash you know it's just <laughs> woo, this is gonna be awesome and, and and then the other is like i like to get people up on a beautiful view you know mm-hmm. And then also throw the challenges in between, you know, the overall is like, you know, look at the terrain overall. Is this going to be a cool view, you know, cool loop? Can I get up on this, on this ledge, on this peak or something like that? What can I do? Then you connect the dots in between. Then you find the challenging, Oh, if I throw in that term. And some of that is found, you know, when you're riding or pre-riding stuff like that, you just find like you come over a little hill or something like that. And there's this little trail, you, you stop for a drink and a photo and you turn around. It's like, Oh, that trail turns right back there. I didn't even see it. And they're like, that's going to be in my road book. <laughs> that's yeah. going to be one. Everybody's going to blow that one. Yeah. That'll be challenging. <laughs> so yeah, you it's just put loop. it back to, yeah. And to me, it's like, it's a lot of to do a quality road book. It takes so much time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, you know, and I think that the biggest one, like from what I've noticed and saying is actually writing them, you know, it's one thing to do them in the map and doing all this stuff. And there's guys um that that do that that they're halfway across the world and hey i need a road book and 48 hours later here's this road book that's within a tenth in a place yeah. they have never ridden so there's people that have dedicated and those are the map men those are the ones it that is yeah 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 so and yeah the map men are reverse you know they're reverse engineering you know mm-hmm. they they too do not they're doing it totally remote they do not you know there's no boots on the ground they're doing it all from satellite picture yeah or maps or whatever their tools are. But the, the one thing that doing it, you know, you have to write it, you have to do it. Cause there's so many things like I found the hard way, you know, yeah. those barbed wire fences do not show up on satellite. No. <laughs> you know, they, you got to ride this stuff and make it safe for, yeah. you know, whoever you're going to share this with, um, whether it be a, you know, a five mile loop around your neighborhood or something out in the middle of nowhere desert that, you know, maybe your buddy's really fast and I want to make sure that, you know, no one's going to get hurt. So you got to pre-ride these things to find those scotches on the ground. It has to be done. And, it, and it's always, every time I've done it, it's like you find a new, interesting alternative route. Like, oh, that, that looked cool from satellite. This is boring as hell. If I go over here, this is really, really cool. Or that's that little challenging turn, you know, you notice and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Def- like, I've seen that on, uh, in, in talking with Dave, he's uh, 
one of the guys that helps the Honda team. And, and, and it was a very specific thing that he said, and it, and it really stood out to me about how important it was for the road books to be safe for him. And that was, that was the whole thing is like, he understands and knows that he's been around racing for so long that he understands the speed. And, yep. and that's something you mentioned is like, even with the car and with different people writing the road books and, and what could lead to it is like, who did you have writing that road book on that day? And what level of talent do they have that they are going to be able to see, well, hey, I only made it over this rise and landed here. But, you know, um, any one of the factory KTM guys is probably going to land at the bottom of this hill, you know, because they're going to be carrying right. so much speed. So there's so many more aspects to it. But for what we're doing, I mean, it's like, you know what, let's just get out and ride. <laughs> just, yeah. Yeah. there's a there's a guy this is a good segue and the guy like uh you know getting something safe and getting into it and doing all the right things to make sure everybody's safe mm-hmm. and there's a guy that's doing the first ever coda rally c-o-t-a-h mm-hmm. rally you can find online okay. i think there's still some entries mm-hmm. first time ever he's been working on this this will be the first legal rally roadbook rally in the u.s okay that's not underground and he he has spent years working with county towns the blm the national force the everybody and got it all approved wow. and got it to, now there's some speed limit there's everywhere has speed limits That's so right. it's really it's like i think if so someone like mason might not be you know it'd be very difficult to do those speed limits you know when you it was a really easy road and you could see it for three miles and boy i can't go faster than you know 40 in this section or so whatever that that limit is it's mm-hmm. in there it's one of the but that's what he had to do to make this happen in the U S and make it official and safe. And he's going to do it, um, uh, Mali Moto style. So you have to make sure everything fits. He has all these specifications. He bought the bins, all your stuff for these days. I think it's five days has to be in those bins. Um, you could travel outside the bid. You know, he's got some rules and stuff like that. There's other things like it's because it's on, you know, uh, where, where some guys might not go, well, maybe this isn't the rally for me. You have to have DOT. It has to be DOT tires. You can't, and, and tubes, you can't run mooses because they're not mm-hmm. DOT. Gotcha. So those rules, if you're willing to follow those rules, mm-hmm. you'll have a really cool epic rally. He's been working on this for years. I'm really mm-hmm. excited. I look forward to being able to, I think I'm going to be able to help him pre-ride some stuff right before the event and make sure, you know, things haven't changed or this rainstorm didn't create a new wash or, you know, mm-hmm. things like that. And, and help others. I think this is a good beginner rally. Yeah. Um, if you're, you know, you like dual sport riding, you think you might get into this. I think this is the one you should seriously look at is the Coda rally. C O T A H. Really C-O-T-A-H, cool. C O T A H. Yeah. Definitely going to yeah. check that out because yeah, it, it's, and oh, the speed limits is something I think that a lot of, uh, I, you know, I don't know how to say, I, I only go back to my rally experience uh, as, as when I was RD for uh, race director for Baja rally in Mm -hmm. uh, speed zones are not like eh, for some people you know uh, you know i gotta go through a speed zone but you're right it it, sometimes that's what it takes to be able to go through this rancher's land or through this right city we're going through a little town or community yeah Yeah. the baja rally had a lot of any racing in baja you have those well you know something like the you know the the noras or the baja rallies you know they have the you're going through this rancher's property this thing and you're going up right next to the house yeah so you have to have these spin limits in it and and have these, and it's a short little while, you know, it might be a quarter mile, might be a mile. Um, and you have these little speed limits where I think in Coda, the, like the whole rally has a speed limit at it at some point. There's some limit to your speed up throughout from start to finish throughout the day. And that's, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, it, to me, I always saw it as that is just one more place where you could win the rally and you can yeah. make up time because. Well, you're gonna get, yeah. And they're recording and watching it. So they're going to be able to tell if you're speeding. Yeah. And not only that, you know, if you don't get kicked out because you're being an ass and you know, <laughs> Besides the rules, that part, yeah. <laughs> but if you get it, you're going to get big penalties. Yeah. And the guy who's able to follow that is not going to do it. And accurate, you know, I have some friends that you know they they get kicked out of, and they are the most they have the most accurate mileage. They don't blow one turn. Mm-hmm. They don't often win. They're not the fastest guy, but they're most accurate. Yeah. You know, they did not go one extra tenth of a kilometer in this right from what you know <laughs> that author said it is this many miles this they did that many miles didn't win you know and that's you know that's sometimes what it takes and i think really as a beginner that's where you're really hooked on not so much the speed you're hooked on yeah, yeah. here comes a turn here it is i got it okay turn next one advance and and to be able to practice that i think it i think a lot of people are gonna have fun as a code around 
Yeah. Not for the fastest pro guys, but definitely for the beginners. No, but for the beginners, yeah. And just to go get lost yeah. for a little while, you know. Yeah. And then yeah. find the bivouac and, you know, hopefully <laughs> when you get to the end of the this road, is how, that's where you're supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think the bivouac's going to be Montrose area and then looping out into Utah up north to, um, I don't think it goes all the way dinosaur. Oh, it goes pretty far north. Um, nice. And it's some epic, beautiful terrain out there. Nice. Yeah, but definitely, uh, I'm gonna have to just start doing some digging and some research on that one, and and um, and see if we can maybe chat with him. Yeah, or them. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, we need like we need those events and we need those kind of things here. Yes. You know, if we want to see the the sport grow, regardless of there being a speed limit or or certain things that don't make it as authentic, but just the fact that you can go out and run road books. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. I, I think all those all the pro guys in Europe they don't have Baja races like we do with arrows and stuff like that. They do, but it's not. It's like what rally is here. It's very limited. Yes. There's not as many of them. You know, everything over there is road books. So, road books and yeah, tighter trail stuff. I've seen a lot. Like I've there's a couple of good videos of like what is a road book, and I've shared it with people. And it's a guy running. I think it was in Italy or Greece. It looks like it anyway to me. <laughs> Speaking some language I can't speak, but he does a really good job of overlaying the road book on it and yes. showing you and seeing it and i bet you all of us have shared it or watched yeah. it and yeah. it's just you know tight neat fun ride train but yeah. um it really gets you it helps you get your head around what is you know what is riding like this to follow a book and yeah, yeah it's pretty neat and seeing the yeah the european style with you know just the train they have and stuff they have they don't, they don't have a lot of wide open deserts you know they don't have a lot of blm land things like that or, or it may be any <laughs> and you know just how do i how do you do that? And it's popular as hell over there. You know, it's like soccer over there. It's yeah. the same equivalent, like the biggest motorsports race in the world. Very few Americans know what it is. And, and if you, you know, a handful of us goofballs, well, you think maybe 60 you know, yeah. of us, you know, <laughs> passionate goofballs know about this yeah. and it's growing every year. Like it's been pretty exciting to see like, you know, not just our rally kit sales, you know, people that are like, Oh, I want this, this car style look, you know, and they go for our, even though they'll never put a bro book on it, they just like that look mm -hmm. to, to, you know, Brayback winning and just all these Americans like, Oh wait, what he won? What, what is that race? You know, and just have an American win for the first mm -hmm. time just mm -hmm. is so exciting. Help build again, back to what you said, build that sport and with the grassroots and Americans doing well and seeing this style of lightweight rally, you know, it turns out, you know, rally race bikes are the ultimate dual sport bike, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're re dependable. You got wind break, you got all the stuff you can put all your navigation equipment on it. Mm -hmm. And turns out, you know, this movement that we have that we feel we, you know, you have the ultimate lightweight tool sport, you know, if you built our built on our kit. Yeah. Yeah. You got the, the mileage, the range and all that stuff. And, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's like more people are getting out and exploring and this is kind of the way to do it. But you know, for the ones that said that I will never buy a BMW because I don't need heated grips and I want to go do more off road, you know, yeah, these bikes, I think, are really, really growing quickly. Um, yeah. And if you're that goofball like me and go, oh, you know what? there's a single track over there. I want to hit that, too. Would you hit that <laughs> on your big GS? No. <laughs> but we, could you? I guess. Would you yeah, not have fun? No. Yeah, you're still exactly. going to have fun with this. Yeah. 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 So yeah, everybody's like, oh, no, uh, the bike feels really light. Uh-huh. Until you're doing zero <laughs> miles an hour. And then it is 650 pounds. You know? right, right. Yeah. And and I will say, but I will give them, I will give the GS guys credit. Um the 1200 GS in the hands of a proper rider in Baja is is actually hard to catch. How oh, yeah. long the Prove suspension's going to last? Yeah, <laughs> right. There's some components. The weight yeah. sometimes catches up. You know, physics kind of play yeah. a role after time. Always uh, there but, to remind you. <laughs> but there's always a talented guy that's going to get it going. I mean, you yeah. see some of the stuff where you know Jimmy Lewis racing racing that HP, and yeah. that's some epic stuff there. I mean, that's basically a slim down gs you know yeah, yeah. same motor for same frame pretty similar yeah um just exciting to see that stuff yeah and i, and I you know really see the movement especially like you, you ask guys like um like Sperger at taco motoko you know mm -hmm. the the huge growth that he's had focusing on the 500s mm -hmm. as you know this is what i'm i'm going to sell the best accessories around these bikes and i'm going to focus just on these and that movement of people going like, yeah, this is one excellent, these 500 CC lightweight dirt bikes, you add a couple components to them. They're go anywhere bikes yeah. um, and can still travel on, the, you know, a long, boring dirt, high speed dirt road. So going to be fine. Yeah. You're not um, breaking its neck. Exactly. Exactly. They've really come a long way. And then not, you know, 
Yeah, you could always spend a lot of money on suspension. Um, get some quality suspension, like you know our buddy uh, Alex at Conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, I run his stuff. I can't believe how nice it is. But anyway, <laughs> plug on that. Mm-hmm. But you know, some of these are coming out of the box. You know, ready to do stuff, and always you always have that. You know, possibility to throw accessories on it, and yeah. that's the market we're in, and we're always happy to help people with that. But just having that platform of a the 500 cc's of 450 350s and be able to you know like i said again bolt on a few things and go anywhere mm-hmm. that's i think people are really really starting to get behind that and go yeah sir, you know sure i have a you know i just i just bought 950 super enduro mm-hmm. <laughs> am i gonna take that on stuff you know that's got a specific tool purpose that i'm gonna you know use that tool in. and and a little 300 is another tool but that 500 really does a lot of overlap and and bolt on a rally tower or or just, you know, minimal screen, like all the stuff at RMS, you've got a really capable bike, whether you're doing road books or just trail riding or exploring. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty exciting time right now, especially with the technology of these bikes. Lately. Yeah, exactly. They've made, and, and the fact like that the recipe has been really pretty much the same for a while now, you know, the 500 being mm-hmm. longer than the two, you know, that, that basic, now yeah it's the the forks and the suspension and the the kits you know your rally kit the the tanks all of that stuff has just come along to to suit that you know 790 changed it i think the 790 brought the guys that wish they were riding a little you know a more dirt capable bike but they were already in adventure bikes and then maybe some of the guys that have graduated from the 500s to wanted to do something one more miles on the road that kind of thing i mean it, it serves its purpose but i don't think the 500 itself will ever be like a because even the 690 right the 690 the ladder frame on the 690 and the way that they're designed is based kind of like on the well the what was it the first ktm bikes the rally bikes were the 690 and and larger but then they put what was it they put the 450 motor in it when they changed the rules into a 6 yeah they frame. basically took the 690 rally the, the yeah. 690 trellis frame mm-hmm. longer swing arm you know just a longer more stable high speed bike and just threw that a uh, high strung 450 in there and i think that i uh, someone will probably correct me if i'm wrong on this but i think the transmission was out of the uh, the quad at the time like a hybrid components of the transmission of that 450 mm-hmm. was out of the quad at the time and now it's you know it's definitely graduated beyond that even oh, yeah. and powerful <laughs> but um but just yeah seeing that progression from the 950s to the 690s and then you know 690 really starting that you know the 690 you buy today or 701 you buy today definitely has you know there's you can see the dna from rally and that that trellis frame and the so yeah, I mean, it's very, very similar. Just mm-hmm. slap some big tanks on it. You basically had the rally bike of, you know, when they were back in Africa. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the only the only problem now is now, yeah, you, you, tanks. OK, that's three grand. And then fuel pumps. And then, you know, you start <laughs> the bill gets yeah. qu- large quickly. It and goes it, crazy. Yeah. And you, you're on a 790, right? With a tower. Yeah. Yeah, seven ninety one. I love that. I I owned. I jumped on that bike right when I was launching for two things. One, I wanted to develop products around it. Two, I just I wanted that bike. Mm-hmm. Just all of it. And talking with, I'm lucky enough to be able to you know talk to people like Quinn Cody, and knowing what he developed, you know his his touch of the suspension tuning and everything on it. That bike out of the box is some of the best, the best handling and best chassis of a big bike I've ever ridden. I've ridden all like I said, super neuros and adventures and all that stuff i've been on gs's and, and, and wow that that and to me the biggest factor are those low tanks that low center of gravity i i would describe that bike as being flickable that big bike i was like this thing is flickable with this weight down yeah i i rode um so a buddy of mine i don't know uh travis uh travis brock from every single sunday um we went out on a ride up to big bear and he had gotten his and had just started working on it he goes here I go and I feel like this is going to be a really expensive ride. <laughs> it usually is, right? Like it usually is. First of all, it's free. Yeah. And you're right. The first thing, I, the very first thing I noticed, I'm going, there's no bike here. Where's the bike? Yeah. I mean, you literally, yeah. like, you think about it and the bike was into the corner in a very linear way. So I was like, I was on my 850 and I was used to my 850. I was like, hey, was, you know, it's an 850. I can ride it. It's quote unquote lighter and more nimble than the 800 GS that I had because it had more power. But the 790 was just so different and and then the first time i remember touching dirt with the 
uh, with the 790, it's like not even a mile in. And I was like, oh, this thing is this thing is different. This, mm-hmm. this bike, this is exactly what you said. This the chassis, the suspension, like the anytime I hit anything on the 850GS, it was like, Oop, this is going to hurt. And <laughs> and on the eight on the 790, it wasn't that way. It was completely different. Like, oh, wow, this actually absorbed it. So I'm still I'm I'm actually in T minus a week from today. I'll be in Alex's shop. Nice. We'll be we'll be working on the suspension on my bike. And, I'm, you know, this is going to be the first bike that I actually go. OK, I'm just going to do the suspension, you know, go all in on it and and just try and get it the best because I intend to keep this bike for a long time. And I'm, you know, I'm like, okay, but in, inside me, I'm still thinking I need a smaller bike, <laughs> there, you know, to run these routes and stuff like that. Because yeah, you, you're going to still get into places, you know, the, the KT and the 790, even on its lightest, what, 450. I, I, mm-hmm. I think the Rottweiler one is like four, 430, 420, somewhere in there. I mean, it, it, they got they got the weight down on that 790, but it is still not a 500, you know, right. weight wise. Right. So, you know, I the 500 won't go away. I mean, I think they feel the 690, I think, is more on the table for for being ruled out because of the seven, uh, the 790 and now the 890. But yeah, I hope they always keep a big single. But I've heard those rumors, too. Yeah, I, I and. Yeah, the six the six ninety seven oh one was just such a cool you know, it's it's kinda of teetering now, right? You know, so the, the trend lately and they don't sell hardly any of those six ninety seven oh ones overseas. It's a it's a US thing, especially the six ninety. Yeah. I've heard I, I heard the percentages of how many they sell in the US versus everywhere, all, all other points. And by far the six ninety is like they're keeping it going for the Americans, it seems like <laughs> they're still buying oh, it's a US bike, and, yeah. yeah. And I, I hope they do. It's definitely got its place there, you know, that big single and well balanced now, you know, single cylinder, you know, nice, you know, displacement. But I see them going that way. You know, if they make a lighter weight, that, you know, the 390, that's not there. But, yeah. but, um, you know, if they make the, the 790, 890 kind of overlappy, shifty thing, I was like, I'm kind of puzzled there. And they jumped that to that 890. I was kind of like, oh, something might happen. <laughs> to the 690 and 701 where they because they're going to fill something in there maybe it's a you know something between the 390 and 790 being a parallel twin or is it that's what I've you know, kind of heard who knows yeah. yeah there's a lot of rumors in that area right now which mm-hmm. is you know I, I still with that trellis frame and that 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 just that look and the displacement it, it fits a ninth an inch obviously then you know there's a lot of Americans are buying the heck out of those 690s they can't make enough but it's um I hope they keep doing it, but yeah, we heard the rumors, right? Yeah. It's yeah. kind of like, uh, this could be, you know, something, but I'm, I'm banking on, I'm thinking somewhere in the 500 CCs and parallel is what I'm, the yeah. I'm thinking it's going to be. Yeah. You know, yep. It, and, and it's a, I'll go back, you know, talking about the big bikes, uh, at Dakar, I kind of miss now that everybody's got a capable big bore bike, you know? Yeah. It sucks <laughs> that they're, now we know for sure because they're trying to limit the speeds that we will never see, you know, the thousand CC, the 1200 CC, oh, that, yeah. you know, we'll not see that again. I mean, these four yeah. fifties are just as fast as those bikes back then anyway, but you know, it's like, uh, yeah, we'll be on small bikes for a while and, and yeah. smaller. Oh, that'll suck if they make it even less limited down to three fifty CCs. Just uh, to get rid of yeah. It. That'd be the beginning of the end of bikes. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I hate to think that, but, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, help, I just think I maybe, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's, they're, they're running out of, it seems like, you know, where do they hold the events, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, it seems to be like trying here, trying here, trying here. So those, you know, where they're at now in Saudi Arabia is like big, easy miles, you know, so where do you slow them up? Navigation. Yeah. And hopefully that, you know, turn, 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 and maybe more complicated, more challenging uh, navigation will, that I'm hoping that's the route they're going to go to try and solve now versus some kind of new rule <laughs> that we scratch our heads on, like the tires. Like, really? Yeah. Hey, guys, it's making last it more year dangerous. we gave you six tires. This year it's four. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Yeah. And you have to do this brand. And you have to do this. Brand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like, and the, no- the knobs can only be 10 millimeters, right? That <laughs> standard. Yeah. 
<laughs> we're measuring them every day. Every, every day. Do it. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Anything more than that and you're done. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Or limit the rear sprocket. You know, you can only run a, you know, a 56 tooth rear sprocket or something. You know, but <laughs> right. They'll come up with something. They'll figure it out. So uh, we've been, you know, we've been talking a lot about the rally kit and all that stuff. So just kind of closing it up. But let's talk about Moto Minded. What's, uh, yeah. what are you guys up to? I mean, when we first talked, you were saying you were moving the shop around and doing some stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. The band aid is getting ripped this weekend. I got to be out by the March 31st. Okay. So um, we're fully in and functioning our new space. It's just getting the last of the, ugh, oh, yeah, that's over there. I got to find a home for that. You know, the last little bits, the tedious part of it's done. But we are operating our new space and every i love it my team loves it. it we have some breathing room we spent a lot of time on getting just our layout more efficient we've got this beautiful linear workflow from you know our our raw machines to raw parts to assembling and testing and then shipping and all has this nice linear flow and then we have this separate area with some beautiful light now for our design slash rd area um just so excited about it um it's nice. Um, we're in it operating. This is like the first couple of weeks that we're like fully in operating both, both, uh, you know, our, basically our office side and our production side. And it's just, we're all excited. It's just a place that like I is back to, I just want to have a place that you're, you're, you walk in the door. It's like, yeah, let's do something cool. And that's nice. kind of where we're at right now. I'm really excited about it. Yeah. Nice. What, um, so with that, that was a beautiful distraction and get out of that and gets back to something I've been trying to launch for, six months now we're doing a lot of testing and refining i'm really excited about this new product we're, we're launching our own switch line we're calling it the bomber bar switch okay and it's gonna it's it's kind of inspired from some of my frustration of some of the stuff that's out there to kind of rally setups having these wide bulky switches i wanted something um bomber as in the name really tough really strong but also very narrow it's not taking up as you know the minimal amount of space on the bar and and we're going to start with a single and the dual switch options for KTMs and others. We're going to offer the switches like a builder version of switch. Just a couple of wires, here's a switch, put on your bar, use mm-hmm. it how you want, you know, have on, off, and momentary. Okay. Um, and starting with uh, some KTMs, and um, we'll do a beta line, a line for beta by Sherco. Sherco's a dire need, actually. I've been working on that, too. They they have a um, – Sherco actually has – and that bike's become, you know, gaining some popularity – Mm-hmm. great platform of a bike but they for some reason these crazy frenchies they integrated the the uh, map switch and the start in the uh throttle assembly so the main housing the aluminum housing of the throttle mm-hmm. where that you know the cables coming in winding around right next to it attached to a part of that is the mm-hmm. <laughs> is the map switch in the start mm-hmm. and wouldn't be too terribly bad either you know it saves a little room it's not as wide as a separate switch but they put a horrible little map switch on it that breaks usually after the first ride, and you don't know what map you're in. No. And uh, so we're going to separate out a nice domino with throttle tube that was as a kit, and then this map switch and a and a start, and and then you can customize it too. Like uh, I'd rather, you know, for the folks that like want to switch up stuff, I prefer to have start and kill together on the right, or I like my traditional KTM style, you know, really dirt bike uh, start on one side and kill on the other. Mm-hmm. And we're going to do, you know, we'll have all those combinations ready. And they will be our typical thing, a plug and ride. You're not going to be splicing any wires. You're, you're going to plug it as a direct replacement. So you're going to unplug your stock switch and you'll plug in our switch. Nice. Um, it's a new plastic we've been testing for a while. You know, as you know, a lot of our stuff is 3D printed. We're mm-hmm. kind of paving the way with additive, the proper term is additive manufacturing. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're working with this new polycarbonate. Uh, with some fi- uh, carbon fiber infused in it, and it is bomber tough, and it looks beautiful. And and with the switch, we're just pushing the limits of how thin we can make this plastic get really, really strong. And uh, we're making it water. Uh, I want to say it's waterproof. We've been testing. We're soaking them in water for <laughs> days, pull them out, to make sure they function. You know, it's nice. you know, we're testing them far beyond the limit uh, where they're at. And I'm giving them in the hands of some of these extreme enduro riders and letting them beat it up for a while. And, um, we've been making all these tweaks and adjustments and I'll ramble on about these for a while, but I'm really excited that we're now that we're moved in, I got the time to finish and launch this product and actually get it in. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm, I'm yeah. super curious to see it. Cause yeah, there's, you're right, uh, about real estate and especially like for me on the 790, I'm like, all right, I got the tower on it. I've got a roadbook holder that I picked up from RMS and uh, rally motor shop. And then, yeah. 
now it's like, okay, well, I need to put a switch so I can f- advance it and retract, you know, go back and forth on this road book. But then I look at my handlebars and I go, and there's no room. <laughs> there's, yeah. you know, so I've, I've you worked. still have to have the basic bike folks. And that's what we're focusing on. We're not yeah. trying to re- make rally switches. There are some excellent rally switches out there. Yeah. We're not getting in that game. <laughs> yeah. Um, and these are basic bike functions. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Just some kill start on. map high low. Okay. Horny. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. There. Yeah. It's uh, and I, I I dabble a little bit in three D printing. Not anything like what you guys do. And and but I can share in the frustration of you know bed leveling and and finding the right material and then coming back when it's you know thirty three hours into a uh, 30, <laughs> 33 and one yeah. minute hour print and it you know breaks apart or whatever. You know it's. But there's just so much that goes into to doing that. Like, you know, if anybody thinks that they're going to get into 3D printing and, and say, hey, yeah, I'm going to make this product and it's going to be bitching. It's not. It takes a lot of work. So I can only imagine what you've gone through on that. It's nice. I mean, we the last three years, we got we got the process down. You know, when I we've got this polycarbonate alloy that specific to us. And that's when you get into that. Like you said, you got in that 3D printing world. The material is it. Material is ninety percent of it. Mm-hmm. Having a material that bonds well, holds up to strength, doesn't disintegrate after years down the road, and things like that. And you saw it like once I once I decided like this is it. These last we're back in three D printed parts on dirt bikes with a lifetime warranty. You break it mm-hmm. in riding or race conditions. Send us a photo. We'll send you a new, new part. Um, we do have a crash replacement if you you know bike versus tree or some other hard object and you're honest with us and tell us it was a crash mm-hmm. we, we could tell <laughs> we could definitely tell like oops that fell for some stupid reason we're like yeah that, that meant a hard object pretty fast you know but we have a generous crash replacement policy it's 40 percent discount on parts and uh get you back on the road so being able to know that industry that well and our our process um knowing that we have the best out there that we could possibly do with the technology we have right now and backing it with a warranty that says, yep, this is going to work on your dirt bike. Um, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a hard, that those first couple of years were difficult. There's a lot of lessons learned, things like that, but we have a process now nice. and, uh, yeah, it's, you know, we got these machines that are, you know, easy to scale up and, uh, um, uh, yeah, we're running on three shifts a day. So basically you come in, in the morning, pull parts off, inspect, see what, you know, you know, assess what orders we have. We're not, we're not just in time manufacturing. We do have stock. Like, nice. yeah, and if you jump on our website, you know, we're best known for our LED kits. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately those LEDs, those nice LEDs made by Baja designs are a little hard to get lately. And there's yeah. a big delay, you know, we're shipping everything, but there's a big delay. Our parts we have, um, our, our products that we make in house, we have plenty of. Um, but the LEDs themselves are pretty long turnaround. So again, back to that, we're not just in time manufacturing. We have stacks of brackets ready to bolt onto LEDs when they come in. Um, and then, you know, we outsource, uh, billet work. We outsource some of the plates we get, you know, we'll get water jet cut or laser jet cut, depending on, you know, the material strength needed, things like that with some of our plates for our rally kits and, um, our, our good friends at, uh, um, uh, uh, billet racing products, BRP. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they're just up the road from us and they do the billet for us. Um, Mm -hmm. so it's our designs, but they, they, they'll, you know, they'll make, they'll do the manufacturing and billet components for us. And yeah, I think we got a pretty good process on it. And when I started Moto Minded, I really kind of like, this is a design company. We're going to design really cool parts. Um, unfortunately with, you know, where we went with when I started and scaling up and started 3d printing, I was like, uh, and I still look to see if we could, you know, offload the three D printing production part of it, or do we spin that off as a separate company someday? Mm-hmm. Um, but I really want to focus on designing, um, and that's you know really the core, the heart of Moto Minded is designing new products and um, the manufacturing and the three D printing. We just happen to do it because we can't find anybody to do it, you know, better, or cheaper than us right now. Mm-hmm. And I think the industry will keep up, you know, it'll catch up soon, and we'll be able to go, oh yeah, X Y Z company, make fifty of these, hundred of these, you know. Yeah, a week. Let's let's get rolling on this. But at this time, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's a it's still a new growing industry, mm-hmm. and and we're watching the metal three D printing too. So the, the polycarbonate that we're the alloy that we're using is pretty um, for what we're doing in three D printing is pretty cutting edge. But I'm definitely watching what's going on in uh, metal centering and and even some of the other um, uh, binding new binding materials. It's almost like makes like almost a ceramic part. Mm-hmm. Just watching where that technology is going. Um, pretty neat we have some 
folks that we've reached out, we might get some stuff that um, is additive manufacturing, but then CNC later with metal. So we're talking with some people on that, doing some, not anything directly with the, you know, with the products that we have now, but just looking forward to, you know, kind of pitching out some what ifs. So I'm constantly looking at where are these technologies going? What, what can we do to be ready for them? Or are they ready for, you know, is this, should we try this now? And, um, it's interesting. It's a really exciting world, uh, that I'm working in. And I absolutely love my job. I love walking in every day and kind of meeting a new challenge. Yeah. Um, it's been fun. What are we going to make today? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a lot of it. You know, we've got a new process. Uh, my guys, if they listen to this podcast, they're going to chuckle. But it was like, when I was a mad scientist for a while. I was like, I come in with a new idea on Monday. I was like, yeah, we're going to launch this. Let's launch it Friday. Let's get it out Friday and do this. You know, like, and had this thing like, and they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, how are we going to do this? We need instructions. We need, te- you know, and all this stuff. And I was like, but this, you know, just, we, we now have a very polished process from idea to doing, I mean, that's where these switches have taken nine months for us to, from idea to, you know, launching. Um, I keep saying next week, next week, but hopefully yeah. a week <laughs> next Friday, <I'm> hoping <laughs> we'll have the first ones launched. But yeah. I see every time I say that something comes up or cheeks us or, you know, or we got to move our shop, you know, there's some like little thing that came up or a big thing, yeah. but um, it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. And, and, getting that and, you know, working now, with ta- you know, trying to balance it with being able to actually ride, you know, it's been kind of fun. We're, we have a fun, we have a track that we can ride near a shop and employees come out and we try to ride on Saturday or Sunday together. It's really fun. It's a good time. We have a, I have a, such a great team. I'm so happy with yeah. what we have going on right now. Yeah. And putting, putting together a team is a difficult, you know, a difficult It thing. is. And you have a small business, like we're in, you know, we're together a lot of time today, you know, we're on top of each other and, and, bouncing ideas and you know each one of us has these talents that we're you know uh, leveraging and and it's such a fun crew to that we have right now um and and then be able to spend some time outside the shop too and and want to you know it's like i see enough of these guys you know going over here but be able to go like hey what are we doing let's go ride said you know let's go the enduro track this sunday and uh it'll be fun it'll be it's it's just a really I'm really happy with what mind it is again. <laughs> it's, it's, it's great time for us. And that, that's good. And that, you know, and it, a lot of people don't understand it. Uh, I've seen it a couple times and you totally just hit it. It's one thing to say, man, I would love to make riding motorcycles my living and job. But it, it's a lot of people may not realize that, that once it is your job, and you have to pay the bills with it and you have to do this. Mm-hmm. It makes it a different, it's a different animal. So I think, you know, like where you're at, Hey, we build products. Oh man, I guess I'm going to have to go out and try and break it. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, like, right. yeah. it's been fun to be the crash tester. It's great. Yeah. yeah. yeah, you get the, yeah. You get the fun part it, of it. If you're, yeah, if you're lucky enough to catch me out on a trails, you'll probably see like six prototypes on my bike at any time, <laughs> whether it be this or that, or, you know, there's something, oh, look close, you'll see some cool stuff, yeah. but <laughs> hey, and, Chris, yeah, that's, this? I mean, that is a benefit. Yeah. To be able to go, yeah, go, go test this stuff today. You mm-hmm. know, and, and really, um, that is an exciting part of it. But also there was a couple of years, like I was not writing, I was not writing. It was not a fun time. And really it was that business part of it, you know, trying to be the account and this and that and everything and be able to offload that now. And as a company grows, just get to the point where we could enjoy our personal time more. That's, that's been great. Cause you, you had it, you had it there. like, you turn that passion into your work and now good luck, mm-hmm. <laughs> good luck with, you know, actually wanting to go ride and, it, 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 that is the challenge with small businesses for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you got to wear every hat, not a lot yeah. of hats. No, it's every hat. You know? Yeah. There's some, yeah. Early interviews, like hiring employees, like you got to be a jack of all trades. You're going to be, you're going to be answering a phone. You're going to be over here, you know, pulling the part off a 3d printer. You're going to be, you know, putting something in a box and you kind of, with the small company that we have right now, you kind of have to spend some time you know, as part of it. You're going to spend time at each one. Mm-hmm. And just because you need to know that process and yeah. how that works, um, it's yeah, it's different. And yeah. uh, and you know, the, we have a handful of designers, we have a handful of production guys, and we can all kind of help out, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's 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 been fun and challenging, like and really gets back to yeah, it's like walk in the office, like okay, what challenge are we going to have today? Are we going to yeah? Is the challenge of 
you know, some new tax law or oh, God forbid, another COVID <laughs> or something, you know, like bring it on. You know, if you're a small yeah. business owner that's, you know, doing that, you have to be ready. Like, okay, what, what challenge are you going to throw at us today? We're going to conquer, conquer it and, and still be able to end the day and go have fun on their bike. I think that's uh, living the dream there. Yeah. Say, and want to go have fun, you know? And yes. Like, All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you exactly. know what? <laughs> it's riding time. It's 530 oh, yeah. somewhere. You know, where, <laughs> I was just looking. So, where where are you guys based out of anyway? I just didn't see that. Colorado Springs. Uh, so, our south of Denver. Um, mm-hmm. We're we kind of. It's a high desert, so there are some. Um, we do get some snow. This is the time of year. Like this spring is kind of time of year we're trying to. Myself, in particular, I'm like ah, my head down to Arizona or New Mexico to ride because we have such weird weather this time of the year. Yeah. We get the most snow in our what we call the front range, which is like uh, Fort Collins, Denver, Colorado Springs, down to Pueblo. This line of ridge, like right at the rain, you know, the, we're right at the start of the mountains going west in Colorado. Mm-hmm. You know, one side, you know, one end of us, you know, twenty miles one way, it looks like Kansas. The other side is, you know, all the beautiful mountains. We're right up against that, so it really changes. The weather gets really interesting this time of the year. And, um, the mountains have, you know, started getting all the snow, you know, back in October, but we really get a lot of our snow this time of the year. So mm-hmm. it usually melts in a day or two, but it's frustrating. Like there are really nice high altitude trails. Yeah. We got, it'll probably be June this year till we're riding. Oh, we can ride but, them. Yeah. But we still can go, you know, an hour East or a half hour South and there's riding, uh, like private enduro stuff, you know, pay them 10 bucks and go ride a pretty cool enduro loop or, or riding area, off-road area. There is a, um, a state park that's not too far away that uh, stays pretty snow-free all year round. There might be some icy gotchas here and there, and mm-hmm. some, you know, little ledgy spots. But, yeah, we're pretty nice. It's a nice place to be able to, you know, ride pretty much all year without traveling a long, you know, yeah. a long way. I grew up in the Midwest, and it was like no riding. It was all illegal or someone's private. Or you spent your whole year to come out in Colorado and ride for a week. You know, it's kind of, that's kind of, we're lucky to have this here that we can, uh, you know, basically where we're at all points West to explore for yeah, and um, it's a really cool terrain. Yeah. Nice. Well, it's definitely on the, uh, on the list to go ride and, and do some stuff out there. I mean, it's, I yeah. know Baja, but you know, <laughs> it's kind of easier sometimes to say, well, I've done that already now, you know, what's next, where's the next, you know, where's the next adventure going? So. There's a couple of events this year. Uh, the TPA, the, the Trails Preservation Alliance, was the grassroots. Like uh, they do a trail symposium. It's called the Colorado 600. Mm-hmm. Um, really cool. They're going to be doing that. It's always out of some epic places. It's like five days of five six days of beautiful riding, led by pros like Scott Bright and other people like that. Mm-hmm. That's going to happen this year. Check it out. Uh, trail Preservation Alliance, Colorado 600. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to do an event with a couple others like, uh, Eric at Wolfman helps up. We team up. Uh, we did it a couple years ago. We didn't do it last year with COVID, mm-hmm. but, um, we're going to bring it back this year. It's called the mountain moto meetup. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all, all its presence is, is a Facebook group or a little Facebook page, <laughs> but you look mountain moto meetup. Uh, we're going to set the date soon. Uh, it's going to be in August this year mm-hmm. and it's out of some of the epic riding out of Colorado and there's a few of us that'll help you out. It's a little bit of trail education. You know, it's not, it's not a full, like, you know, guided route. It's just kind of like, Hey, we're going to gather here each night, talk about riding. And the next morning we're going to have some people, the knowledgeable people kind of send you out in your directions, everything from big bikes to some of the most epic single track riding in Colorado. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh. so I'm just in the background. I, meandered over to the Colorado 600 stuff from uh, Colorado TPA. Yep. .org. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool stuff on this. Huh. Definitely They've been doing it a long time and yeah. uh, it's really neat. Yeah, and you'll probably be able to ride with some, you know, uh, really interesting people led by, uh, like I said, Scott Bright and Ed Caesar, a couple of the trail leaders on some of the routes. Mm-hmm. Um, there's um, big dual sport rides, uh, more challenging single track stuff, everything in between. And um, folks like, you know, there's some uh, pros that show up there. Uh, Andrew Short shows up to it quite a bit just because he loves riding in Colorado in the summer. Um, uh, he shows up to that often. Uh, they usually look for some uh, new face to be part of it. Um, there's a big dinner one night, kind of talks about, you know, what 
you know, it's a trail is the, you know, trails preservation Alliance. So that the, the money that goes into this helps us keep trails open. They basically pays and funds lawyers to fight, to keep, you know, trails open in, in Colorado. And it's a very important kind of uh, movement that we need because there's a lot of people trying to close access to us. So we need to fight for our right to ride. Yeah. You're, uh, it, it, you're scaring me. It's starting to sound like California. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, you got the challenges everywhere, but yeah, yeah, it is not, it is a very similar fight. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I can, yeah, I can only imagine. I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, but, but we'll see, you know, we'll see how it, it progresses, but yeah, events like that should definitely, would definitely help. But I'm, I'm going to throw, I mean, since we mentioned it, I'm definitely going to throw a link on, uh, uh, on the podcast description of this. So, you know, people can find it and, and help kind of get oh, the word out and all that. Yeah. Cause it's, I mean, to me, I see this and I'm going like, cool, there's an event I could go ride in Colorado. Uh, I don't know if they'll do, uh, it'll work for big bikes, but you know, whatever. I mean, I'm sure it could find something to get lost in over there. Oh no. Uh, you no, know, big bike dual sport ride. Like I had my 790, I went out, uh, um, but they have, yeah, they have big dual sport loops, um, to all the way to challenging single track and everything in between. Really fun. You'll see the best of Colorado out of that event. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, uh, looks like I'm going to have to request some time off in <laughs> September. You got it. Yeah. What is, uh, Crest of Butte? It's usually right around, they try to do it, uh, around the, uh, KTM Adventure Rally. Okay. So I, I know but, you know, both of those didn't happen last year. Yeah. That's <laughs> that. If they do it this year, I really hope they do. I think they're, they've been challenged, you know, with all the COVID stuff, but mm-hmm. also, you know, getting a resort. They usually do it at some resort that mm-hmm. is, you know, like a ski resort has been very popular that they do it out of. So they have big parking area, big event space, but also cool riding, you know, obviously ski resorts kind of some mountainous area. So they seem to do that. But I think, you know, obviously with the world we've been in the last couple, you know, year that it's a bit challenging to book that and have it. So nothing's been announced this year for the adventure rally, but again, the TPA tries to put it right around there. So some of the guys just do it back to back or, Gotcha. They have it, you know, kind of close. If you're going to travel out a long way, you might as well hit both. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Nice. Well, definitely, definitely on the list now for sure. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have to do it. Well, cool. Well, I really, really appreciate you taking the time and, and talking with us and getting uh, getting some information out there. Uh, that's really cool with, uh, with the thing to support Mason Klein on the rally kits uh, that you're selling. So mm-hmm. definitely uh, drop a link in there, and and we'll see that out on Sunday, uh, and then get uh, get the links and information and all that stuff up there, as well for this uh, the Trail Preservation Alliance as well. So great, and thank you for inviting me. This is cool. I, I enjoy the other podcasts. Listen to all the you know all those guys from Matthew to Scott Wright and Alex on it, and all the others. I, I haven't got through every one of yours, but I've been going through, <laughs> and it is like I have it on in the shop. Like I'll be in my shop this weekend, and uh, that's the thing I do is podcast. And okay. yeah, I got a, I got a, I use uh, Spotify, oh, okay. and I've been rolling your, yeah, I've been rolling through your stuff. It's pretty neat to be able to queue it up and listen mm-hmm. to them, and and I've been sharing it and telling people, hey, check out this podcast. Yeah, I uh, appreciate that. Nice work, nice yeah, work. I really I appreciate, appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the next one, the uh, this last one that we did um, with Adam Shirt of uh, the Vintage One Thousand, uh, dude, that's some crazy stuff. <laughs> you have to check that one out. It's uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna I have it. That title just caught my eye right away. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, like that's dude, going on the list. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna need some vintage bike parts. I'm sure after that. <laughs> You know, I may actually have to stop doing this because, you know, it's like, all right, I'm talking to you. I'm thinking, man, I, you know, I need a bike like Robbie's bike. You know, I need that motor minded tower and I need this and I need that. And then I talked to him and I'm like, <laughs> I wonder what kind of old beater I can find on Craigslist to go do this stuff. Right. You know? <laughs> These podcasts are just too expensive. <laughs> you know, next week we're going to talk to Alex. You know, it's like, <laughs> right, exactly. This podcast brought I'll to you, you in part by Visa. You know, <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. I, I'm excited to hear, like, yeah, and I was listening to Alex's and that you guys, you know, talking about you going to visit him and everything. And I got a chance to visit him. Uh, couple of months ago and uh it's it's a cool shop and be able to see that and the work he does is just i he's you know we've been in the rally stuff together and i've uh, i've always made up some excuse to and it's kind of like you know i'm using everybody you know i'm using this guy's suspension this guy's suspension and i'll get uh, out to get it and this I, on my 500 which i haven't even really released it much yet he went through a kyb he just 
set me up with the best suspension I've ridden to date. And it is so planted, so stable, so confidence building that I, I just didn't know it was possible. That guy has the touch. And it's, it's as you talked about, it, it's not, you know, you get what you pay for. But I think bang for the buck, the suspension these days is worth every penny. Yeah. I you kudos know, to him, and I'm excited for you getting it set up with his stuff. And you're getting a new stuff, right? That he's developing yeah, for the stuff. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah so that's I'm, cool. I'm looking for you know we we went back and forth and did this and that. You know you could do, and and you know I got to the point where I was like, okay, I just need to s- not try and be so scientific about it and really decide stop overthinking it and just let him do what he does. <laughs> you know. Fine, because I know suspension, but for cars, not for motorcycles. And you know, I'm just like, okay, you know what? I give up. Like, all right, what's what? What's the deal? What do I need? What? Do you need? And he goes, "There's black magic in there." there is. <laughs> it is. So, like, and each guy has Change his own little mind. touch and trick yeah. and everything. And it's just so it's such a fascinating industry to be in. Yeah. It is a couple clicks, a shim here, a shim there, and next thing you know, it's like you're riding somebody else's bike. You know, so yeah. It's, uh, I, one of the best selling points, so I could skip it in real quick, is like yeah. I was riding this latest suspension that he built for me. I was out riding um, some washes, and it was all you know a lot of side by sides in it. So I had that that it had some long bends in this watch. It was a big wash, and had these long bends and that those that side by side chatter. You probably mm-hmm. I don't know if you expect it. Like those little washboards that they make are just unique. Yes. And I'm just railing in it, riding, and I'm with a couple other guys, and they're just like. <laughs> They stop and they're shaking their wrists and like enough of this. Let's ride somewhere else. I'm like, what? What? Like it ate it up. I didn't even know. Like visually, I could see it, mm-hmm. but I didn't feel it at all. Oh, you didn't feel like it on the bike. His, yeah. Didn't feel it on the bike. It was oh. kind of the first time I I realized it. I'm like, oh, oh, this is next level stuff here because yeah. you know I just dealt with it before, and then you get to that point is like, oh no, I didn't feel that at all. Like that low, that little stuff, that stiction and everything, and to be able to hit. Like I got it on, I've got, you know, the four and a half gallon tank. I've got my tower on it. I got my gear and everything and it, and be able to have that stuff, just eat it up and work in those different ways. You know, when the tank is empty, you know, there's a lot less weight in that thing and you're tired by then and yeah. still work at that point. It just, ugh, it's just awesome. I, I'll um, get off that. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> I could talk about it all day. It's like, um, I just really, you know, suspension has been, I geek out it more and more lately, you know, and, and I never really, I didn't know. I have not spent one dime on, you know, tuning suspension until like 20, you know, kind of when KTM, or I should say WP made some changes back around 2016, 17, 18, you know, it was kind of like, oh no, this is not working at all. I got to pay someone to fix this. And that was kind of when I started spending my suspension. It just kind of worked. And I was at a, I was at a different level, you know, back when I was riding the, the bikes in 2008, 9, 10, 11 and stuff. And, and just seeing where, you know, some of the bikes lately, I was like, no, you have to get this worked on. It's it's okay out of the box, but you really got to hire a professional to get suspension done anymore. To get it knocked down. Um, yeah, get knocked down. Even that 790, you know, with, you, do you have, what, what, do you have that WP? Do you have just the base? Yeah. Explore? Okay. Mm-hmm. You don't have that, like, yes. jump up, the Explore Pro, Pro is it? No. Is that the one? No, and, and okay. so I was in, I was warming up to that idea, and then, I, you know, I, I started talking to Alex about it, you know, what's the setup, and then he, you know, he said, you know, I got something coming, you know, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> when going, he says okay. that, pay attention. I yeah. got something for you. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, and it's like, and I mean, you look at it, and I mean, hit, the numbers will be out and all of that stuff, but you're still, you're still going to be ahead, even if you went with his full kit, full A kit, um, you're still ahead because even if you, you're not getting Kosh Makoda and the WP Pro and you're not getting the Diamond Lyca and all this stuff, and and then you still spend all that money on WP, and then you still got to send it to Alex so he can yeah, valve it yeah. and spring it for you. Yeah. Where yeah. his kit is kind of already ready to go, and it's already all the top-of-the-shelf stuff. So, yeah, that's just like, okay, fine, I'll wait. You know, and I have I am the worst for shiny object syndrome. Like, <laughs> You're in trouble. Yeah, it's horrible. You know, and and so I was like, okay, we're going to be patient because you know I've known Alex for a while. I met him through Baja Rally, and and we we hit it off, and we're always you know back and forth when we were in the bivouacs and stuff like that. And and it's like, okay, well, obviously he knows what he's doing, and and you know, obviously he built conflict into this household name, and so. All right, we're going to conflict. We're going to get it done this way. And I had a lot of great people offer, you know, and, and help me 
kind of opened the door to other suspension shops. And um, I just, you know, in the end, I was like, you know what, I, I just got to go with, with my gut. And, and it, you know, I said, okay, let's talk to Alex. Yeah, so cool. That's I'm excited. Cool. It should be good. That's neat. Yeah, we'll see. We will see. But cool. Well, I will let you go. I think you're, mm-hmm. I think you're an hour ahead of me, so it's getting late. <laughs> Yeah, I'm up late anyway. It's okay. This is worth it. This is fun. Thanks for, again, thanks for inviting me. No, no, I I appreciate you coming on and we will, uh, I, you know, I'm think I got some more episodes and stuff like that, but I might, uh, I guess I can do multiple people on an episode. So we might do some panel stuff here coming soon. Let's figure out what we can do. (laughs) I would love to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to do that. Get some, uh, get some, get some people back on and, and new people on it. So, so yeah. Well, cool. All righty, sir. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. And we'll uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks again. Chat soon. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. All right. Whoo! Hour forty five minutes on that one. Awesome talking to Chris from Moto Minded and uh, and talking about the rally kits and some of the rally stuff going on. And uh, I'm absolutely stoked. Uh, This Trails Preservation Alliance looks really really cool, and I like the idea that it's right around that time of the KTM. Uh, adventure rally i've been wanting to go to that and last year when i was warming up to the idea this one covid thing hit and you know now the world's upside down but i think it's going to be a lot of fun so i'm going to look it up check out the description i'm going to put more information on there uh for what i'm looking at here on the computer screen uh also put links to chris's uh company moto minded a lot of you guys have probably heard of it if you've got uh dirt bikes they build a lot of different stuff um, it's not just the rally kit, you know, there's different mounts and things and accessories for the bikes, uh, their torch hem- helmet light kit. Um, they, they do the, the light replacement. So for your KTM to put stuff into the masks, uh, like Baja designs, led lights and stuff like that. So a lot of really, really cool products. And like I said, I mean, I started watching this when it was back in 3d printing where I was like, cool 3d printing, um, so they're they're doing a lot of really really good stuff so check out his website the link is in the description for the podcast and i think we are going to wrap it up i want to stay under the two hour mark but hope everybody's having a good week it is going to be this is friday but we're actually going to see this or hear this you'll be hearing it on sunday uh so if you like the podcast and if you haven't heard any of the other last episodes, we've got the Vintage 1000 on the last episode. That was awesome. We've got episodes from Alex Martins uh, from Conflict Motorsports, uh, as well as Scott Bright. Uh, we have got uh, Rally Moto Shop with Matthew Glade. So there's a lot of cool information on that. If you guys are getting started in the world of Rally Raid, uh, there's a lot of good information that we're trying to get out to you guys. So don't forget to like and subscribe if you've got some value out of this podcast. Share it with your friends. Follow us on Chasing Waypoints underscore official on Instagram and also uh, on the Facebook uh, under Chasing Waypoints. You're going to see this podcast shared there with the links for Spotify and Apple. Uh, we are available on Google and a couple of others, but you're more than welcome to tune in on those and drop a comment there. Uh, questions or something like that i'm sure chris will be checking it out and you guys can uh, ask questions if you have anything about the moto minded products and what's going on for the future for them um technical questions whatever i'm sure he'll be willing to lend a hand so anyway hope everything is good with you guys we will see you guys for the next episode